phone. Mm. It's I uh, excuse I and I. That pause, that sudden pause. Just got further confirmation of you know extra so called extraterrestrial activity, especially in South and Central America, like Alarma T V. I don't know if any of you know about Alarma T V. Might be have to go to the Spanish so called channel section dial, like forty something or so forth and so on. But it might be on your dial somewhere, you might be able to pick it up. Usually comes on like in the evening time, like ten ish or 10, 11 ish, you know, so forth and so on. Anyway, that's very important. I know there's going to be more and more evidence that's going to show people that this is real, so called extraterrestrial. But then again, many of our ancient people were already saying this. You understand? And, and just like we forgot who we were, we also forgot a lot of this ancient knowledge, this knowledge of who we are. You understand? And who are our brothers from, from another planet, as it were. So we do have brothers from another planet, but since we were, um, I won't say interrupted, but since this, this point came up and we decided to just share this before we even go forward with this particular Torah portion, or really, it is going forward with the Torah portion. It's giving additional evidence, you know, saying, to prove what the scriptures say, that this is the word of truth or the ma'keru, you know, saying, the word of truth or the true ma'at. Now, ma'at itself is very interesting if you look at it from an ancient Egyptian perspective, ma'at. And then if you look at it from an Ethiopic perspective and in the Amharic Ma'at, that Ma'at is connected with judgment, like, like, like a great crowd. It could also mean a, a great song of people or of beings, as well as a, a, a great or divine judgment. Now, it's interesting from the Ethiopic root and the Amharic root, right, the pure language and the ancient Ethiopic, and then you look in the colony of ancient Egypt, you understand, remember Egypt was a colony, so let's think of what a colony is to the mother country, so these terms are still similar, but they are particularly um, um, nuanced for the, the consciousness or the sentientness of that particular population, it's so like when we look in the scriptures, we can see alien ships, so-called alien ships, but are they really the aliens, or are the aliens already so-called amongst us? That's one of the, you know, that's one of the questions that have come up, but what is interesting is that this particular portion here, we have um, 32 um, terrara, or besina, besina terrara, which means, excuse me, which means on Mount on, on, on Zion Mountain. Now let's get let's get our scriptures and let's go into this in a little more in a little more detail and then we'll try to make that particular connection between between the two. So here we have the scriptures before us and we're gonna to touch also on when we talk about Ma'at and righteousness. Remember when we left off we seen that righteousness theologically a, a basic interpretation or explanation of righteousness in the scripture is being justified also, or just is also words that are different in English, but in the Masoretic or traditional Jewish or Hebraic um, Bible or Old Testament, as well as in the Ethiopic, you understand, and the Royal Pure Language Amharic, we find that the same underlying word or zadok or siddik is found. And this word is usually also found in association with uh, fitit. Fitit. Now, in this particular Torah portion that we're about to go to, which is speaking about on the mountain or on the terara, and then on the mountain, and it's interesting because when you think of Moses and the mountain, do you ever think of like a kind of like almost like a close encounter kind of situation? I mean, not like the movie and that kind of space aliens, grays, and all that, but where there was some activity which was only described by the effects, the effects of that particular activity. We already know that the, that the ancient aliens, it's a history channel um, series that we offer on ancient aliens, you know, for the educational studies, you know, ancient aliens, check it out on our doc video. You understand, or you can probably check it out on the internet, Ancient Aliens History Channel. And they kind of touch and make those connections. But, of course, from a 
European or Eurocentric perspective. But in some things, some of the facts are there because the left brain is, you understand, there are some beneficial aspects to that left brain. It's not balanced. And that's what we get in the word ma'at is a, is a sense of balance. You understand? A sense of recourse and remedy. So you see how this righteousness is going to connect directly with the law, right? Especially in the name of the 33rd, at the 33rd so-called degree. Now, 33rd degree, they say, is a high degree even in so-called masonry. Now, even masonry is a kind of a carbon copy or a bootleg of a more ancient order or like the mystery school, the wisdom school, is how Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 7, verse 22, when describing Moses being learned, and we know that he was learned for a time in so-called Lower Egypt, and then he fled to Upper Egypt and Median, and the connection with um, um, Yotor, or Jethro, is also very much key to the priests were there to keep this law in order, as well as the hygienics, too. You understand? So for civilization to go forward, we have to understand how important when we speak about the order of Melchizedek. You see, why is it so important for us? Well, first of all, Hebrews tells us, and in, in, in the epistle to the Hebrews, it tells us that the, the order of Melchizedek, you're saying, which is connected and coming out, springing out of Yehuda or Judah, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, is after the pattern of, of Aaron or Levi. You know what I'm saying? But it's on a higher, it's on a higher law. You know what I'm saying? But it's after that pattern. So what does that mean that Melchizedek is after the pattern of Levi, but it's of a higher order that springs from our Lord, springing from Yehuda, Judah, and the connection with Edomawi, Hila, Selassie. Well, we touched on it when we touched on Emor and more. Well, we did the a brief etymology, Ethiopic and Afro-Shemitic etymology on Amhara, Emor, Amar, uh, more as well, and, and linking that, we have the Arab or the Ishmaelite Emirates, but then we also have the Ethiopian Amhara or the Judeo-Christian Amhara, the covenant people, the line of the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of David that was renewed in the highlands or the mountainous, the mountaintop. You, know, you remember Ethiopia was called the roof, the roof of Africa. The roof, the roof is on fire, right? The roof of Africa. That's what Ethiopia, when you look in um, classic writing, Oriental, the Europeans, and even some of the Mohammedans, in writing about Ethiopia, always note that high plateau. It's like when you come to Ethiopia, everything, like the land lifts up. It's like the highlands. So there's the whole highlander connection, which in a sense is interesting if you understand the truth facts about it, and you look at, say, a fictionalized um, northern version of Highlanders, the European version of Highlanders in the show and movies of the same name, there's a link. But if you don't know the foundation and you try to reverse engineer it, well, you, you're going to get kind of lost and confused. And that's what happens a lot. A lot of times one try to reverse engineer through the fictionalized, even the matrix, but you have to understand what the foundation, what the foundational principles. So in the study of Torah, this is what we learn in these um, books that, in fact, the um, Ben Midbar of our Midbar is coming forward, and hopefully should be forward within the next seven days. So those who've been asking about um, um, the book four or the Torah portion number four, um, Bar Midbar, Ben Midbar, which means in the wilderness, you know. So there's some lessons in here that we haven't had the opportunity to go into full detail. And some of y'all, if you have a copy of this or you check out um, the Wikipedia, you understand, as well. Um, though you have to go to each one and some things might be changed, especially we always notice as soon as we people start to find things in something, they're going to try to change it up for, for whatever reasons. You understand, well, let that be. I and I have the original of these um, Judaic studies which are from a European, a Eurocentric perspective, but we have the Ethiopic, you understand, to balance it. And, and we have the code of the languages, including the Hebrew. And we're going to demonstrate that as we go forward. So Behar, right, is the 32nd, and the 33rd is Bamarinya, the Shur'ate, the Shur'ate, 
or Beserate, and in the Hebrew it is Behukotai, Behukotai, Behukotai. Now what does Behukotai mean? Now Behukotai, if you turn, if you have a copy of this, or if you go to the, the Wikipedia version of it, um, the online version, you have Behukotai. Some say the Hukosai, the Hukotai, with a third sound. In the Hebrew it says, for my decrees, my decrees. This is the second word and the first distinctive word in the Parashah, the portion, and it's the 3-3, three, three, the 33rd. You know what I'm saying? The 33rd, not also the link with Amhara is significant in that. It's the weekly Torah portion, Parashah, in the annual Jewish or Judaic, you know what I'm saying, um, cycle of Torah reading. Now, when we know our birthright, we can't, we look at this and we're not so much offended. We're offended if they don't properly, you know what I'm saying, present the evidence. That's offensive. And in our version, we're going to check some of those things, you know. But in many ways, a lot of the foundational principles are kept. And this is what is so vital about um, the Torah study. So when we talk about Bar Mitzvah, which we, is a subject matter we'd like to get into some more details, because it doesn't matter how old you are, brethren, you have to remember that in our proper order, one would go through a particular initiation or, or preparation of study that would better prepare them, you understand, for that title that we carry, which is Aras. Ras is not so much a name. It can be, it's part of a, it's like a title name in that sense, but it's basically a title. Yo, this is why we, when we talk about Lidge, so forth and so on. That's why when you understand the connection of Lidge and you're reading um, Proverbs, Misale or Mishle, one and, what is it, one and, and, and seven? One and seven or one and eight where it says, my son. You recognize this Lidge, my child. You understand? Hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy, what? Mama in not. The mama, so ma, so we have that double ma, that, that so we have a double portion here, and there is a duality in this. You see, there's a duality in the scripture. You know what I'm saying? A divine duality. The father is likened to the son. You understand? Know what is the name of the father, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? You know what I'm saying? There's that duality as above so below everything in heaven and on earth in Christ is already sealed up but we have to come up we have to meet the grave you see when we meet the grave we tap into though we tap into the government the spiritual government and temporally we are able to execute or work out the divine edicts or his decrees so now the second word okay we touched on that so this is the tenth and the last reading particular Torah reading or orit minbab in the book of Leviticus or in the Orit the Lewawiya in the Amharic. Now it constitutes Leviticus twenty six and three to twenty seven thirty four. Now we as Hebrews and black Jews and other Jews of other ethnicities, foreign or not, in the diaspora generally read it in May. Now this is still May and we're about to end this particular month and cycle. So we're coming in also to the wilderness, in other words. But this book is very important, especially when we start to talk about the Melchizedek order. You understand? And really studying this particular book as alongside with the Scofield. The Scofield in this book will give one a full 360. You understand? And when you have that 360 degree, and then you're dealing with temporal, worldly, so called law, whether on the state level, national level, or international level, at least you will begin to understand what's what, what is structurally right and what is in practice incorrect, and then you can defend, you can preserve your, 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 your birthright, L live within the contract, you know what I'm saying, not just as a so-called a artificial person under color of law, but being in law, you know what I'm saying, being in law, you know what I'm saying, not just being outlaws or being under law, you know what I'm saying, those who are under 13th and 14th Amendment, we keep speaking that because what is that? If, if you don't understand what that means when we say that, please check it out. The Moorish brothers have gone into great detail, just breaking down the basic legal mechanics of it. And this is some basic knowledge. You understand that every, every bar mitzvah candidate, you know, in the natural, on, at the age of 13, should know this. Because at that age, 
a Hebrew and a Jewish boy becomes a man. Not because it's a tradition or culture, but because they're prepared for that. They're prepared for real responsibilities when we talk about well, what's wrong with Negroes, blacks, and colored. A lot of these foundations were lost, and it's interesting because in Behuk Otai, similar to Deuteronomy um, chapter 28, it explains, you know, the curses um, for disobedience, the blessings and curses, the Levitical blessing and curses are, are given here. Deuteronomy coming from Moses was more like the kingly, because Moses reigned, in a sense, as king over Israel, not with the title but in the position, you know what I'm saying? In the position he was. Cause remember, in Egypt, he was a god to Pharaoh, you know what I'm saying? And, to, and Aaron was his prophet. So in, in, in Israel, in this wilderness experience, Moses was as king. And, and there's a connection with the name Jeshurun. And I like to ask ones who, who think they know, well, what's the connection with Jeshurun? Where it says he was king in Jeshurun. Who was king in Jeshurun? Who was it talking about? Some would say, so my God. Is it really speaking about God? And saying God is the king of kings. We know that prophetically. You understand? So let's get that, you know, let's get that right. You understand? Let's get that right right there and stay in his righteousness. So the name Behuk Otai is interesting. Because as we touched on in the Imor, and then we, when we linked it with the Amhara, Har in the Hebrew, or Hor, Har as in Har Megedio, means the, the mountain of assembly, but it means mountain. So when we just backtrack to the thirty the thirty second degree, we have Behar, 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 and it's, it means on the mountain. Be prepositionally on ha the mountain. Now see that link right there with Ethiopia, the highland, Hara, Amhara, the highlanders, Ethiopia being the roof of Africa, having many like flat table tabletop, I call them like um close encounter type mountains. You see where it has the flat, what they call the Amba. You know saying? The Amba, the flat top mountain. All right? And um, we know the whole extraterrestrial so-called connection with Ethiopia, even in La Labella. And Ancient Aliens also touches on that. So when we get to see some of these things, yeah, we're going to see more. And some of them might be fake, but many of them are going to be true. A lot of these vids on extraterrestrials, it's not for us to be like, ooh, and awe. Oh, but this tells us that we're living in a, a particular time frame. And saying, remember our Lord and Savior, he went up. You understand? He ascended into the cloud. That's how the writers of that time, they can say he went up in a flying saucer. How would people know what's what? You, you, you know what I'm saying? So it wasn't speaking out of its time, but it was speaking in the context of its time. Even Christ on the mountain with, with um, um, Moses and Elijah. You know, some might imagine that like some sort of holodeck experience. But let us not think that a lot of these technologies have not existed. I mean, we've thought that a lot of things were, were new. You know, I'm sure growing up to the, your present age and stature that you thought some things were new, and then you find out that they're not really new. Somebody just renewed it. Somebody else did it before, but they don't get no credit for it. But they just renewed it. So you find that, well, if that's so, this whole thing about aliens might not be uh, so much new. But I caution our brothers and sisters, do not get in that far in mind vis-a-vis -vis the so-called aliens, be in Jah's, in Jah way, be in Yah's way. You know, so don't get in that foreign mind vis-a-vis -vis these aliens, so forth and so on. You know, it's good to study up on some of these things, but make sure you're studying and you're doing a real investigation, you know, because there's a lot of spin out there. You know, we're told that the aliens, about the movies, that they're coming to enslave us. Really? You mean like the white man enslaved us? Or like that they used to be slaves in ancient Israel or, or servants. And in what sense? You know, because two, there's different kinds of so-called so -called slavery, you know, because the biblical slavery was far less. That's why when, when the word says, even in Behuk Otai, when it says um, that um, the, the curses for disobedience and showing how they were removed from the land and they're going to go into a state of servitude or slavery, the people probably thought, okay, you know, based on what they, you know, what the jaw law was and what was practiced in that ancient times, they thought it might be bad, it might get bad, but they never could conceive, you understand, of what happened, you understand, to I and I people as these two books very accurately explicate right here and, and from, Babylon, from Babylon to Timbuktu, 
You understand how we ended up on the west coast of Africa and eventually over here in the Americas and um, the Valley of the Dry Bones. You understand these two books by um, Rudolph R. Windsor, which helped to give us a foundation, the historical foundation and perspective on our nationality. You understand as Ethiopian Hebrews or as Beta Israel. All right, so Behar. So Har means mountain and one thing we didn't say in the last portion that we did, we'll just make a mention here, we have Har, then we also have Hor, as in Heru, or Horus, and the name, which is Ethiopic as well, of course, because Egypt was a colony of ancient Ethiopia, we have Herui, Herui, which means um, a chosen or elect. So it's a name, but it's like a title name. It's a, originally, it was used on ancient times, previously, let's say, Right, because originally we're going back, going back very far, so we can see different things in different generation and dispensation, different nuances. But previously, like in ancient Egypt and even Ethiopia, it was a title that had become used as a name, probably similar to Ra's, right? But in its proper application of government, it is a particular title. It's almost like to say the anointed in that sense. So when it's saying Behar, in that word Har, when read in the mysteries, all of those subsets that I just try to give you briefly with Har, Hora, so forth and so on, they come into the interpretive matrix. You see, there's something known as the interpretive matrix. In fact, I don't know if anybody else calls it that, but I and I call it that. You know what I'm saying? So feel free. The interpretive matrix, right? And... The interpretive matrix means that when we look at something in its ancient hieroglyphic, we have to overstand from our mosaic or from Musa, right, that it's the wisdom school teaching and it's interpretive according to context. That's why we keep pointing out context. So what is the context of its use here? So sometimes a word could mean anything if you take it out of its context, but if you put it in its context according to the traditions of the time, there's only... Um, a, a few, if not come down to one, main proper fit, you know what I'm saying, for, for this particular use of the word. Now, when we look at the word um, hard for a moment, now, are we pretty clear on this? Because I'm I'm, I'm we're going to come forward to this again. You know what I'm saying? First is that birthright. Remember the birthright? We dealt with that in Bereshit, you know what I'm saying, or Berasit, you know what I'm saying, um, the Hebrew Genesis, that's we get the foundation. Now we have nationality. We see the Beta Israel coming out. They become a nation. You understand? They become a nation, right? Um, and then they have a name, or from being the children of Jacob or the sons of Yaakov, right? And we have Yaakov, Yaakov here in ancient Egypt. They come out and they have the name of Israel. Now, Israel for that people at that time was like the monarchy. Israel would have been, remember, there was a mixed multitude. So there were different peoples who also were in bondage. That's how we know that the bondage was not so much racial or even tribal in, in, in a direct sense, but it connected to the tribal or the racial, so-called, what we call today the black-white thing, racial level. And then it went past that to a religious level. There was a certain religious interpretation or interpretations. I think Macy um, Gerald Macy in book one, the book of the beginnings, um, he, he goes through that in exhaustive details. And when we now study it in connection with Torah and start to get the overstanding to it, we can see that, that it was not the, the so-called bondage is the word that's translated. Not slavery. We, in, we interpret today slavery, but that was the bondage. Even the bondage in Egypt was nothing compared to what the curses were speaking about for disobedience. Even Yah, Jah says so. He says it's going to be much worse. It's going to be, he doubles it. You know, you know he folds it over. And then he doubles it and he doubles it again. You know, saying? like if you fold a cloth. You understand? So, Tzedek is the second part, or Tzedek of Melchah Tzedek. Now, Melchah means the name. I mean, it means, the name means the king. It's interpreted as the king of righteousness from the Hebrew. But we have to recognize that the Hebraic was the mosaic encoding 
that was used, you understand, after that period of time, which took the basic, the basic um, symbolic logic from the hieroglyphs, but tried to take away the outer animal and other thingness imagery, you know what I'm saying, in order to, to, to continue a certain cipher of understanding that was, was to be gotten through initiation, but a actually is preserved, we find here in Leviticus among the Levites. That's why when we touched on the animal sacrifices, we were connecting it with some of the basic of Egypt to show you how what the Hebrews did was an upgrade. So Leviticus, in a sense, was an upgrade to what was being practiced almost universally as regards religion out of Egypt that had degenerated because there was a lot of there was a lot of mix up that was going on in that time. And that's a whole other kind of level. But remember, it was not the racism that we know today. The majority of the differences were cultural and really it comes down to religious, you know saying religious, spiritual, cultural differences. Not so much what we have in white supremacy. Remember, at that time, it, it was not black supremacy. There was no other supremacy but the black people at that time. You have to understand. So it wasn't really black supremacy, but, but reverse engineering it from where we're at now, we can call it black supremacy. But we should recall in mind that at that time, we didn't have to ascribe a color to it. In fact, if any color was ascribed to it, it probably would be blue instead of black. Because blue basically is that heavenly color and the color of the law. You know what I'm saying? But there was war. Remember, there was war in the heavens. And that can be overstood on this particular level as a spiritual warfare or a warfare of interpretation, the true versus the false. All right? So we got, we got this basically right now, we're going to return to this, and fitta as well is important. You know, because fitta means to loosen, at its roots means to loosen, like you loosen a knot. You understand? Know like you're freeing something. Like you're redeeming something, fitta as in fitta neges, right? The law of the kings. Now let's see if I have to use some. I have to use some other stuff to clean this right here. So, with that being said, all right. With that being said, right here, let us go to break right down some of the etymology. Some of the etymology here. Sometimes this thing is dry erase doesn't erase so dry, right? So remember the little um, thing about the alcohol, the rubbing alcohol can be used right now because even the weather, you know, the weather starting to be more humid. Priest is kind of, okay, but it's almost like a marker, but the rubbing alcohol helps, helps with it. We might just keep this up here for a moment because it's still important, but we still are in we can maybe call this series of teaching the Kingdom First, the Kingdom First series, the Kingdom First and and His Righteousness series, right? The Kingdom First. In fact, just keep this in mind. The the, the real disciples, when I say the real or the faithful disciples, the faithful and the true ones, the ones who are sticking truthfully and faithfully to what they know, admitting the truth and to their best ability doing it. But you have to admit the truth first. And when it's difficult to do the truth, you have to pray and get that spiritual strength. We all do. You know, for something, well, yeah, I admit it, but it's difficult. Yeah, you have to get the spiritual strength. There may be some spiritual forces, unbeknownst, that you have become obligated to. And you have to break those, you know, you have to break those um, chains spiritually. Now, um... Let's deal with Behar. This is, like we said, the double portion. The double portion right here. Um, we'll still leave up righteousness, you understand? But a righteousness of what? The kingdom. Remember, we connected the fact that Revelation chapter 1 talk about, um, it speaks about, in the greeting of John to the churches, he says that Christ has made us um, priests and kings and properly interpreted and this is connected with what he's in Ethros, what Peter says in his epistle, a kingdom of the priesthood, a kingdom of the priesthood, or like Prester John in Ethiopian um, history, 
or in legend too concerning Ethiopia, Habesha, quote unquote, Abyssinia, quote unquote, um, because that's a fringe um, appellation, that's a fringe name or a fringe name, a foreign name, Abyssinia. Even His Majesty clarified that fact, and many of us have to also clarify that fact because ones want to say Ethiopia is not our name, but rather want to give us a foreign imposed um, Abyssinia. You understand? Know Abyssinia. Um, and that is not true. The evidence is there, and we've already presented that, and others have it elsewhere. But that's a, that's a, different, that's a different conversation, different reasoning. For right now, so what we want to deal with right now is the hard this double portion. So make a note of that that this is a double portion. Whenever there's two of these, we we, we call this a double portion. And there's an explanation once again down here on the Behar that the Luni Solar Hebrew calendar contains up to 55 weeks, five five, Mr. Five by Five, Revelation five five, 55 weeks. The exact number vary between 50 and common years and 54 or 55 in leap years. In leap years, for example, 2011, last year, 2014, the year after. Next, um, 2016, um, Parsha Behar is read separately, right? It says in common years, which are not leap years, for example, 2012, 2013, 2015, 2017, 2018, Parsha, the portion named Behar, is combined, one name, Bambarinya Besina Terara, is combined with the next kufu or the next portion known as the Hukotai to help achieve the needed number of weekly readings. And then it has a, a ram's horn, the ram's horn down there. Now we know the ram's horn from the mysteries connects with who? You know what I'm saying? The, the, the ram, what, well, well, Atum Ray? You understand the ram's horn, a tomb, tomb, fitchum, a perfection, a completion, a ray, short for a ray, the vision, right? So this is this double portion here with our marker. The double portion that we have right here, this will be number 30, this right here, the RSS, right? Number 32 and 33. This, this makes it you know, makes it special, makes it important, in addition to it being 2012. Um, and the two are Beha, right, Beha, or Terara. We'll first deal with the Masoretic, you understand, based on the, the Ethiopic code, you understand, in other words. So we'll give you what the, the present Judaic Ashkenazi interpretation, then we will review it, give it a judicial review based on the Ethiopic, right, and see if it's Temesasai or if it's not, if it's, if it's similar, you understand, or if there's some difference or nuance, and see what that means. Now, the next one is the Hu Ko Tai. Now, this, 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 this K here is really a Q sound. Some double it to get the garum, to get the particular the hukotai, the hukotai. When you see that double, the hukotai, it's like you're saying it twice, but it gives it a different flow. You understand? A different flow, and you know, with, on the mystical at the higher levels of word, sound, and power, that really, that really matters, or that that really affects matter. You know, it really affects matter. You know, so um. That is also another level. This gives you the basic foundation. So after a while, you begin to intuit these things and then go and check them out and find that they're right and exact and reason for others. And some who might be a little more advanced on this or that will give you affirmation. Say, how, how, where you get that from? For real? Wow. Well, yeah, but that's like the high level of teaching. But you recognize that the basic foundation has allowed you to lawfully, you understand, you know, it's giving you access. That's really when we talk about Kabbalah or Kabbalah. You understand? Know it's not just kind of this abstract looking at stars kind of a thing. You understand? Know saying? But the Torah and the scripture is a, is a main key. And also living the life, walking the walk, keeping the Shabbat. Otherwise, when you deal with Kabbalah outside of that, this is where it turns into, at, 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 at worst, a 
some form of like witchcraft on a certain level. That's why you hear a lot of folks about Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. They want to do some trick. As long as they just keep tricking themselves, but they come up against a real like bar mitzvah candidate, in a sense. You know, on, on that level, even a 13-year-old Jewish boy who's been brought up correctly, you understand, know would basically be able to command more, you know, more of the field. You understand? Know That's why they don't do it against those individuals. In other words, um, not to speak magic, but there is spiritual power. I mean, look at what the Bible is speaking. You understand? Know There's spiritual power. What is spirit? Spirit is the ear. You understand? Know Even this commercial on TV, if you check it out, it's got Kanye or something like that. They have now the uh, uh, the red, gold, and green. Like, so seal the ear and the red, gold, and green. There's nothing to get. Don't get emotional about that. It's just, it's just interesting, isn't it? You know what I'm saying? But if anything more, just pray on it. Now, here, this word har, we're going to now connect the Ethiopic and the Amharic in this particular dictionary, you know what I'm saying, of the Amharic language. Right? Dictionary of the Amharic language. And this is, as you can see, the date right here, I think 1841. Right? This is by Reverend Charles William Eisenberg. And it's a, it's a highly recommended um, book, especially for our Ethiopic studies. Because when we're studying from the Ethiopic perspective, we are going to our very roots. You know, we're like going to like the, where the library, you know, the archives was kept. You know what I'm saying? For so much of our ancient cultures because of where the crossroads really were. You know what I'm saying? And where the kingdom authority was there to protect the archives. Because we know if that wasn't there, it would be like ancient Egypt or some other place where all kind of foreigners, foreigners come in and just take stuff, you know, and then claim it like their own, so forth and so on, and, and do a lot of other stuff with our art and facts, our artifacts. Now, when, when we talk about heart, let's break this down. We said there's a... There, there's a like an interactive matrix of, of many different word sounds. Now, something might have the same word sound, but doesn't have the same outer meaning. Now, if you study certain words that, that are similar in, in word sound, and you connect it, you might see either the connection, but the connection could be synonymous or antithesis. Now, in hard, what's interesting is that you have more of a kind of an antithesis in the different meanings. In other words, a difference. In, in the means that seem so abstract, you understand? But remember, there's the double horizons, too. The, you know I mean? The double horizons, the east and the west. We're in the west right now. From the mysteries, you will understand that's the Amenta, and, and that's the, like the land of the dead, you know, or the land of the rising sun, some might interpret it. And it, well, actually, that would be the east, you know. But I'm not going to go too much into that because that might, that might, um, that's a whole study in itself. But I point out the dual horizon, the behut, the, 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 the hutet, you understand, the double horizons, because even in the Psalms it speaks about from sea to shining sea. So when we speak about the Ethiopians at home and abroad, we have to recognize what the Almighty has put in our hands, even by our dispersion, you see. But being outlaws and disorganized, we cannot access that, and every other way that we try might give us false hope, but ultimately will fail us, you understand, because we are not moving according to our birthright, you understand, we are mo our natural, in the words, back to the word natural, forward to the word natural, we talk about natural, Ionized Rasta being natural, but we have to recognize natural in its applicative sense vis-a-vis -vis the law. I'll just, and, and this connects with the real meaning of this, the heart or the connection of this heart, interpretively speaking, where we have, uh, have har on one level. Let's go through this right here, har on one level. Here on page 13, 13 first har it has as har as silk in the, in the Amharic of the time. You have hira. Well, you have hara and ara, which means to go to stool. Now, those Arab speakers would know hara, right, to go take a dump, right? Then, I know this might sound funny, but then they would say hora, hora, which means freedom. Now, maybe this is just me, but I'm looking at things metaphysically. So I'm seeing the, the, 
the triunity according to Selassian dialectics or Trinitarian dialectics. You know, I'm seeing the spirit of the tripartite and it's the spirit, the soul, and the body. So the body's part of it. You know, you could say, well, in spirit I feel good, but if your body don't feel good, you, you, you're not really fully at peace. You see, so Christ, he healed, you understand, on many different levels and showed us the many different levels to our beingness. But this grid, this, this um, bondage that we're in causes us to look everything as first being physical. So we only see the physical part of it. You understand? And we lose the spiritual part. And then when things break down, the psychology goes, goes away. You know, we get even the double-mindedness, you know. Some people, they call it paranoid, schizophrenic, um, psychological disorder. They have a lot of different ways they, you know, they play around with this. And then they bring in their sorcery, the, the pharmaceuticals. And for maybe some regions out there not being people's doctors or whatever, there might be some need of that among some. You understand? But in many cases, it's part of what Revelation talks about. That's the sorceries. You understand? How else do you explain something like methamphetamines and, and even crack and the heroin, a lot of this stuff that, that, that just destroys one? You know, even if they take a little bit, it really adversely affects it. They try to say that, that cannabis is like that. You understand? But, you know... Um, Cannabis in its drunken form and in, in its being drunk, because I and I not smoke. It's it's the herb that smokes. You see, the herb is smoking. I and I drink, and see that's getting into the dialectics of our language, you know. But that too is another reason. So hira ira har har hara ara means to when we say defecate, it means to shit, right? Basically, right? Now it's interesting in, in the older. Um, and hard, but it's still used among those who know their language and can use it effectively. That chewa in it, right? Um, be conversant in the language, you know, um, because that is also part of civilization, understanding words. So even in the English, the etymology is very important at some basic level studies to recognize what does the English words. We're touching on the Haric and Ethiopic and the Hebrew, but for that. For those that, that might be a little more inaccessible at the moment, just start to check out the English words, like emancipation. You know, emancipate means to free from hand. But when you go deeper in, in like, law dictionaries, I wanted to point this out before, because I need to put this up into the archives. Uh, but it might be used for a time. This is a, look at this book right here. This is, this is Black's Law Dictionary. And, you know, through our you know, legal councils and, and others within the community, your, the Ethiopian Hebrew community, we acquired a copy of this. And it, it gives you the definitions, legal definitions of many different kind of things. Now, when we look up natural, right, so is it natural to defecate? Why people laugh and find it funny in a sense, you know, the shit? Now, what do we say... <laughs> When, when in connection with defecation, if something's wrong with folks, we say, oh, you're full of shit. Right? Don't you say, like, you're full of shit, yeah, right? Or you may want to say it, or you have said it, you know? That means that, um, now what's interesting is that on the opposite level, Bamarinya, we have har in the sense of harinet. Harinet, arinet, harinet. Now, when I first was doing my own studies, I came across it when Christ said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And I saw that root there, and, I, and through some of I and I peoples and other, you know, Ethiopian informants, that means one that maybe wasn't so close with them, but, you know, they helped out here and there, and we're very grateful in the name of the King of Kings and His Christ for their help and assistance. We immediately recognize that that word is also used as a, some say a bad word or offensive word. It's not used in polite company. You understand? Because in flight companies, like, almost like saying to a person, go sit down, in a sense, you know, in a more polite company, you know. But then we saw harinet, which in interpretation would be like um, either going to defecateness or in its more usual interpretation, freeness. Now, on a holistic level, and I, and I was, was studying holistics at this time of doing some early translations and interpretations of the Book of the Seven Seals around 19... 91 or thereafter, you know, we got to recognize, wow, in the Essene Gospels, Christ speaks about 
freedom, you know what I'm saying, but, but, but also the holistic level, you know what I'm saying, what we call the organic level. Now, the problem or the challenge that I see among Rasta Farai, you know what I'm saying, or the problem with Rasta is but the challenge among Rasta Farai. So the Rasta Farai can meet the challenge. I don't know about the Rastas, but the Rastafari can meet that challenge, is, is to recognize that part of the inertia of the movement, you know what I'm saying, is that we haven't taken it in this full Trinitarian dialectic, in, you know, in, in this full tripartiteness of recognizing in, in spirit, you know what I'm saying, in, in soul or the psychological level, you know what I'm saying, and in and in, in body or the natural level as going beyond even on the natural level you can go break down those threes too there's a level we have to deal with this at law you understand at law this means to preserve i and i freeness when i say freedom we'll say freeness which is more correct a translation by Mavinia. you should know the truth and the truth shall bring freeness out even the form of it being um qualified in a sense by 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 a verb in the Amharic which was which freedom coming out or harnet which could be interpreted and I did in one particular um um some notes say that it will bring like the the, the stool or the shittiness out. It will clean out all the the shit and the bullshit and all the kind of you know what I mean? And then I began to recognize, you know, the spirituality that we've gotten in whitewash. You know, maybe um, fear and nice, but no wonder it's not applicative because it's not looking, it's not speaking the truth, dealing with the real levels of things. And now we learn that things like even colonics or, or things like flushing and fasting and these things lend and tend to health. But then the reason why people don't do these things we find to be also spiritually motivated by bad or no spirituality, not true spirituality, and therefore one psychological, mental, mind state. So on the physical flesh level, we get these kind of uncontrollable so-called desires, which you could also interpret in a demonic level. You understand? But then all praise be to the King of Kings in the name of Christ that he's given us the word, you know what I'm saying, and the Holy Spirit to guide us if we make I and I decision in spirit and in truth, right? So, on the natural, let me just share this with you. On the natural, it says natural here, right? This is natural. This is a law dictionary, right? Natural says, um, untouched by man. Let me say this book is almost nearly $500. One book. One book. This book right here, about $500. This law book right here, right? And, and, Unless one is in the law, in a sense, you know, or have in-laws in the law, one cannot even access it. You know, we're saying, in other words, it's not, it's not out there. Even though it might get out there, of course, and maybe we're making this challenge to ones who are like us in the printing and publishing. You know, we're saying, so we got a good PDF, send it forward. Anyway, um, about five hundred dollars for for one book. So you know, think about how important the books are because. Here now we learn that natural is untouched by man or by influences of civilization. It says wild, untutored, and it's opposite of the word artificial. That's the key phrase, artificial. If you are under Negro status, black, or colored, that is artificial. You understand? To everything that was pre the enslavement of your people. That's artificial. It's like you've given up thousands of years of true story and true history for this brief period in your experience. You understand? So now you're on the artificial you understand, status. The, jurist, the, the, the juristic meaning of this term does not differ from the vernacular, except in the cases where it is used in opposition to the term legal. So this word natural can be used in opposition to the word legal. And then it means proceeding from or determined by physical causes or conditions, as distinguished from positive enactments of law. Positive enactments of law. Um, and that means the so-called white aspect, you know, white and black, the checkerboard, that's positive and negative. Um, or attributable to the nature of man rather than to the commands of law, or based upon moral 
rather than legal considerations or sanctions. Now, that might be a little legalese there, but now think about the argument we have in the New Testament concerning the law of God in Christ versus the law of sacrifices or the, the old form of the Judaic law, the pharisaical application of the law. It's like what we have presently right now. Ones who are under the artificial status are similar to those, um, those who are under the so-called Jewish religious Sanhedrin and the, and the pharisaical laws in the time of the Moshiach. Now we have the same thing that's going on on the outer level as well. Um, and we want, we'll, we'll get into some more of that, y'all willing. But in, in natural born citizens, natural born, I mean natural is very important. And let me sum this up right here because I want to get a little more into the etymology of this, present the etymology. But let me just give you maybe the main reason why I think this is so interesting and maybe an example rather. There's an old vid out there. Most of y'all who've been seeing Illuminati videos probably have seen this video. This video is History Channel video. It's, uh, it has David Icke in it and a couple of other of the um, Illuminati conspiracy, some of the Masons. I think History Channel and Mason. We might have, have that in our archives available for, for, for the educational you know, distribution and so forth and so on. Anyway. In that particular video, it was talking about uh, Baby Bush, right? Baby Bush. Mm -hmm. So let's let some Bush burn for Baby Bush. Mm -hmm. I say this because at least his example of this is, should be a good example to I and I. Even though it emanates from a Eurocentric perspective to law, but the application is true irrespective of... of, of, of race or color or, or any of those color of law kind of issues. It was talking about a corporation that he established some, some, some years ago and how the corporation had made some monies but then it's like, you know, they're trying to indicate that, you know, he used his father's and his grandfather's leverage and business and was very shrewd and he made money from this and it kind of showed the incorporation of it on the screen, the corporation document. And it kind of goes across the screen kind of slow. And if you have a good picture of it, you could pause it, and and if you, you could read it on the screen, and I think it's in one of our night videos too, the one on um, uh, under God. It might be in the under God video. Cause I remember at that time it was the time I think I, I seen it, and if you pause it, it'll say I something to the effect of I George Bush, the natural person, so forth and so on and so on. But the part that caught my attention was I George Bush, the natural person. I was like natural person. I mean, what is this? You know, now some will say, oh, because they're reptiles and so forth and so on. Maybe, but that's, the, first I want to understand this that's right in front of me. That reptile thing maybe is hidden and got to get some decloaking device if it's even there. You understand? But this part is right there. You understand the fact that George Bush said that he was a natural person. And then it follows through of others who are in that class or that higher class, almost like the highland class that we're going to describe with the Amhara, um, who are part of that high, they're like the, the keepers, you know, they're like the ears of this so-called Western civilization. The, the, the Kennedys are also part of that, so you hear their names a lot, these ruling families who trace their history, blah, blah, and so forth and so on. But this means they know something that they probably don't tell everybody. Well, you know, when you get a corporation, whatever like that, you should do it like this, you should do it like that, so forth and so on. They probably don't um, let that be, you know, let that be known. But when I started to look into it, that is part of what we were talking about with, like, birthright, um, name, nationality, but ultimately with sovereignty. He's saying that he has civil liberties. He can claim civil rights if he wants to, but he's not limited or obliged to them as those who are under 13th and 14th Amendment status. And what's very interesting, brothers and sisters, I know I've been pointing to this, I'm trying to say this is the key. Check this out. And you're probably going to see some news stories and a lot of other things that's going to give some interesting, I mean, there's already been a lot of stuff already, but you might not have been conscious to it. So you heard it. But if you look at these things again, you'll be like, oh, why, why do you do this person like this and that person like that? Aren't they both people? 
You, you know what I mean? And it explains why they treat so-called Negroes, blacks, and colors with artificial names at law different, especially in cases of crime that are not about any violence, no injury, like no murder, death, or no, 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 and not even money crimes. You know, this is how they could do the whole Rockefeller so-called drug laws and the rest of that, too. In, in, in many different ways, in many different states and conditions, depends on each state is a little different. But in this book, uh, The Valley of the Dry Bones, I think it is, um, Rudolph Windsor, he goes through, he goes through what happened, um, like, uh, he goes through this when he talks about the black political struggle after the Civil War. He deals the background of it. Then he deals with the transitional objectives vis-a-vis so -vis the defeat of the, the slaveholders, the rich uh, the European uh, American land-owning white supremacist gentry, the hypocrisy of Andrew Johnson and the Northern Democrats. All verifiable information when you go to the archives and a lot of this is online, but you've been given a certain narrative. Now you can believe that narrative or you can find the truth for yourself. Now, everybody talk about freedom, or freedom, so forth and so on. Well, you should have the freedom of mind. So, you can talk to freedom about people who are not even in a free legal status, therefore they're not in their proper person, and, and it doesn't even make any sense. They don't even know how to interpret it. Even if they understand that somewhat, they don't know how to act on that, especially if ones are acting on them under an artificial status. Um, so, the connection with Torah and the connection with the real level of the struggle, you understand, for human rights, you understand, and, and, and um, for our, our proper place under God's sun and on God's earth, you understand, as the once lost but now found day to Israel. So when we speak about Har, you understand, Har means mountain. The connection we have ethiopically links with um, freedom. You understand? Freeness, but it also links with a physical freeness. You understand? Like evacuating your bowels, physical cleansiness, you know, fasting, you know, fasting, and all these things. Now they're finding that when done in moderation, that's the key word. Because some would say, well, if Ethiopians fast twice a week, I'll fast four times a week. And you might be doing something that Ethiopians anciently understood because they had somebody like you that did that and basically hurt themselves. So they found the balance. You know, they found that which was in right relationship and right alignment. And this is what we mean when we talk about sultane and civilization. And, and, and biblically speaking, it's power and it's authority. Because sultane, you understand, means proficiency. So it's learning and putting faith into fruition. You understand, our faith into fruition. So we're faith-based, but fruition is the goal. You understand, fruition is the goal. The... the, the it squares, in other words, on that faith base. So, in this right here, we have hard or, or hot, and also heror, heror, which means hot and heat, right? And harnet, harnet yewet ahuneng, I became free in that sense. So, they became free, interestingly enough, and they went to the mountain. Notice that connection, they became free. And they went to the mountain. And let me just show some of y'all here. This is just the page. So you can see it. It's on this side right here, right? You can see it for yourself. You know what I'm saying? Maybe pause it. You know what I'm saying? See it for yourself. Read it. Check it out. You know? Um, this book, we'll try to make some of this available, you know, internet-wise. And it's out there. You know what I'm saying? It's already out there. All we have done is, you know, to put this under the line of Judah, you know, stand under the society, this mansion, and the Rastafari, and to publish it as widely as possible for means that we have at the present time. Now, the interesting thing is that, let's get the marker for a moment. The interesting thing is that Behar, which Bamarinya would be um, 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 the Sina Terrara, or we can put for now the Terrara on the mountain, but there's a word that comes in between the preposition of bet, and that word is Sina. You know what I'm saying? It's Sina. So let's turn our scriptures, if we will, to Leviticus 25 and 1. 
25 and 1. Let's read this verse together right here. 25 and 1. Now, it, it is captioned as the law of the land, the Sabbatic year, the law. Now, this is very, very important because we're speaking about the promised land. We're speaking about repatriation. His Majesty sent folks back and said, thank you for coming, thank you for what you intended to do, but next time send the right people. Some got offended with that. But, but he's speaking about his righteousness. This is his righteousness. So for my part, I glory in the Bible. So we are looking in vision to the promised land, to Africa and our promised land. But we have to become prepared as a people, even here, the Midbar, or in the wilderness. And so this is the code right here. And if it was studied in tune with a, a, a good interpretation in the Vayikra and the Midbar, it provides probably the best critical fa uh, um, interpretation that, that gives us a basic insight both into its ancient application and even its consideration in modern law because Torah has more affected modern law the modern common law that we have right now that came through another black law but with the law of the black nobility in Europe particularly in England that comes down to us in common law or Bible law to this very day and the code behind that is the, the Hebraic or the root you understand so when we now make that connection there this is part of our birthright you understand so it gives us a better standing it gives us standing you understand, at law. That's all I keep saying. We have to correct our status. But we have to understand what does status mean. You know what I'm saying? And what happens when one does not know the proper application or others mis malpractice law against their natural rights, i.e., their human rights. You always know, recognize that though we are here on a national level, truly the scope that Jah has given us in spirit and in truth is international. You know, so we, we begin now with getting our papers right. So we have to get right with the scripture. You understand that right with the context. So here it says, And Yahweh, or the Lord, if you please, spake to Moses, Musa, in Mount Sinai, saying, verse 2, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath to Yahweh. So what's the first thing we are to do when we come into the land? And I'm, I'm sure there's an applicative here individually when one comes into the land and one comes into the promised land, into the African land, the Ethiopian land, and they, and they get that piece of land. It says right here, to keep a Sabbatic year. Now, we pointed out um, Judaism and vegetarianism, which is uh, a very good, you understand, a very good, this book right here, by um, Schwartz. Interesting because Schwartz actually means black and German and thanks to J.A. Rogers, Nature Knows No Color Line, he makes that link of the nobility and the, the, the Ethiopians and the Amhara and the Emirs and the Moors, you know what I'm saying, in that whole connection over there, which are the children of Abraham. That's the key. All those are the children of Abraham because it says Look up to the stars if you can count them. You, you know, can you count them? I'm going to make your descendants, your offspring, your zara'ah, your seed, like this. And so it is even in this day. So this is a good application right here. And it's interesting because if you look at the modern um, European uh, Jews over there, predominantly, you can see that to some extent, whether they are all, quote, religious or not, they recognize the science that's contained in the scripture. So whether it's done out of truly faith-based motivation or not, I and I can't be the judge on that right now, but the application of the principle and the blessing according to the natural and the supernatural law goes beyond race or ethnicity, so forth and so on. So if we say that this was meant for I and I and we don't do it and then we wonder why we are in the situation we're in, like landless people, you understand, um, who are still, you understand, kind of held hostage because of our ignorance of the law, both Jah's law, Torah, as well as the law of, of the so-called civilized nation. And we know that Ethiopia is actually from ancient times a civilized, but we can also say a civilized nation. So let's understand that connection. So this book right here, it helps to kind of bridge 
the, 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 the biblical, the Torah base with an application as well as science-based evidence of how when you keep that sabbatical year and you let the land rest, and you do it according to God's way, you have abundance and blessing the elements, you know, work in the, in, in the eye of favor. You understand? Know because it is Him who is the Creator. So we have a demonstration, you know, so we have to thank, you know, Jah for those who in some sense of the covenant have demonstrated and give us like there, look, there it is. Now, if they are who they are, and can do such, then what excuse do we have? So let's understand. John says that he will break off the natural branches, which are us, the Ethiopian Jews, the black Hebrews, because of disobedience. He broke us off, and he will graft in these other ones. How be it when the time is full and we have returned, repented, how be it he cannot break off the, the wild branches who want to be disobedient and regraft us in? So all praise be, hallelujah, to the King of Kings and his Christ. So, with that being said, what is contained in this portion? Let's go through this so we can um, catch up, at least do the hard and then get with the hukotai. So the sabbatical year for the land on Mount Sinai, the Sina Terrara, the Har Sina. Ha Elohim told Musa to tell the Beta Israel, the house of Israel and the Israelites, the law of the sabbatical year for the land. Leviticus chapter 1, I mean chapter 25, verse 1. Chapter 25, verse 1 and, and 2. But he says, um, a Sabbath year to the Lord. Then it goes on to explain, and we'll go through the breakdown right here in the, um, the study book, the Hebrew book of Leviticus, Vayikra, where the people could work the fields for six years. But in the seventh year, the land was to have a Sabbath of complete rest, during which the people were not to sow their fields, prune their vineyards, or reap the after growth. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 3 to 5. They could, however, eat whatever the land produced on its own. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 6 to 7. Now, it's because these things, people talk about the famine in Ethiopia. I submit to you, that is because of this, this al kidan not being kept. All the other religious activities, church activities, good. But this not being kept in fullness broke that covenant with the land. And therefore, as the scriptures say and the prophets say, it broke the staff of bread. You understand? It broke the staff right there. You understand? And when you understand divine law, and this is moving, this is not so much a religious thing, this is in divine harmony, this is holy, this is holistic. You know what I'm saying? This is what caused this is what caused the famine. And we'll get in some detail and give some examples of it. But the people here, and we as the people, if we choose to, to accept to Kabbalah, were further to hollow or make holy the fiftieth year. The Eobelu, the Jubilee, the Eobelu year, and to proclaim release for all with a blast of the horn to proclaim a release for all with that blast of the trumpet, Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 to 10, the shofar. Each Israelite was to return to his family and his ancestral land holding, was to return to his family and his ancestral land holding. And Ethiopia, and we mean Ethiopia in the true ancient borders and scriptural borders, as it says in the scriptures, in other words, the Holy Land, inclusive of what's known as, quote, Ethiopia, are our ancestral land holding. Leviticus 25 and 10. Some say, well, the Africans don't like us, won't accept. Listen, we do God's will and we come into covenant. He is obligating, he obligates himself to take care of the next part. He says he'll drive them out, he'll deal with it. You know, um, O ye of little faith, those who might think contrary wise, and let the doubting mind, the yea and nay, the double mind has come into them. Leviticus 25 and 10. In selling or buying property, so this also deals with economics, overstand. So we have an economic system here. You know, and, and there's no reason why we cannot put that into effect in, 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 in theory, on the speculative, overstand it, and then apply it where applicable. 
in selling or buying property, the people were to charge only for the remaining number of crop years until the Jubilee, when the land would be returned to its ancestral holder. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 14 to 17. Now, Jah Ha'elohim promised, Uruku, he promised to bless the people in the sixth year so that the land would yield a crop sufficient for three years. So in the sixth year, the land would, would yield a crop that was sufficient for three years, Leviticus 25, 20 to 22. Now, Ha'elohim prohibited selling the land beyond reclaim. For Jah, or Ha Elohim, Baruch Hu, the true God, owned the land. So who is the true landlord? It's the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. He owns the land. And the people were but strangers living with God. So what happened in Ethiopia was a breaking of that covenant with the famine. That's why it's matching who causes famine, God or man. You're blaming me, but I've been telling you we need to do this, and you've been doing the opposite thing. Now famine comes, who's to blame? You all, you all have broken covenant. So even though people say, we've been here for such and such, John says, you're just strangers. And he has removed other people off the land when they've fallen into, um, you know, um, 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 what they call it, legally speaking, um, almost like foreclosure in a sense, you know, um, eviction in that sense. Because the people are strangers living with God, living in covenant. You know what I'm saying? In covenant, both on the individual personal level, you must be in covenant, and then with your true brother and sister who also seek to do the will of our Father, of the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what I'm saying? How you shall know them by their fruit. Leviticus 25 and 23. Now, if one fell into